Does size really matter? More about this and other stories on This Week in Retro. High resolution color graphics. This land of high technology. The revolution in technology that made the information age possible. Those kids are not afraid of computers. Retro hard drives uncovered. The BBC Micro is turning 40. Rest in peace, Mr. Dotman. How many is too many? All this, plus our community question of the week on This Week in Retro. Up to date news for out of date tech. I liked the opening line today, John. You, you did well to say it with a straight face there. <laughs> <laughs> now, before we go into our first story, I just wanted to make you aware of it's that time of year again. It's the RMC charity calendar when we use our powers for good. Um, this year, the theme of the calendar for 2022 is uh, micros and consoles behaving badly. So we've got machines which have crashed, um, which are in a bad state of disrepair uh, and, and just make you cringe when you look at them. But actually, somehow, all of that uh, destruction works quite well on a calendar. It's a nice thing to hang on your wall. So hopefully, Duncan's popped some images up on the screen if you're watching the video podcast. You can pick it up from rmcretro.store. And um, 100% of the profits this year are going to All Sorts, which is a charity local to the cave, which helps uh, disabled kids and their families with things like youth groups and uh, activities and things like that just to enrich their lives. So um, it feels good, John. It, it always feels good when I'm the recipient of so much support throughout the year and um, and good things from my viewers. It's nice to uh, use those powers for good. So uh, go and grab Absolutely. yourself a calendar. And the, and the calendars, the calendars are always so well made. Uh, I usually buy them in, in packs of five and give them out to all of my retro loving friends as Christmas nice. gifts. So uh, yeah, the, very much in support of, of this endeavor from you, Neil. All right, Neil, moving on to our first story. Do you remember the first computer you owned with a hard drive? I do. Um, it's just out of shop behind me. It was a 486 Packard Bell PC. Um, I did have a machine that was capable of having a hard drive before that in the Amiga 500 that I had, but the cost um, of adding that to my Amiga 500, was it was totally out of reach for me at the time. And then when I did start to accumulate some pennies and be able to afford that kind of thing, you, you reach that crossroads of is the money best spent on a hard drive for my old Amiga 500 or should I put it in a pot towards a PC going forward? I had no doubt in my mind. I'm sorry, Amiga fans, but I had no doubt that the PC was the future um, <laughs> as, as my Amiga 500 was aging. So it was an easy decision for me. I put that money into the pot. The Amiga got sold and the cash from that went towards it as well. And then I got a PC. It was a 486 Packard Bell. Um, I think it was an SX. 25 or maybe a 33 cpu and it probably had about a 40 megabyte hard drive which just sounds minuscule now doesn't it 40 megabytes but mm -hmm. I, I struggled to fill that thing you know even with the latest and greatest games that was a huge amount of capacity for me but that's where it started with hard drives for me yeah how about you uh, we had one early on, actually. My family's second computer, which was an IBM uh, ATXT clone, uh, it had a hard drive. Uh, I remember it came with this auto loading shell that featured uh, a dozen or so programs. It's weird, Neil. Somehow the computer came pre installed with all this software, everything from Lotus 1, 2, 3 to uh, the <laughs> first Leisure Suit Larry game. I'm sure it was completely above board. <laughs> <laughs> there was no shenanigans going on, but um, I'm I'm sure among the retro community, I'm in the minority as is hard drives for eight and sixteen bit computers that weren't PCs were notoriously rare and expensive until the late '80s or even into the early '90s. Um, do you remember seeing a lot of hard drives on your friends' computers before you moved to a PC, Neil? Not a huge amount, but I do remember seeing them. And again, it was with my PC owning friends rather than mm. any other system. It's weird. Uh, over the years, I've tried out lots of old PCs uh, in here, including the range that Amstrad did. And some of the Amstrad, like the 1512 uh, PC, some of them came without a hard drive. And it just feels wrong using a PC without a hard drive to me. No matter how old it is, it just feels wrong if you're doing everything from floppy disk. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, even back in the day, um, that's not to say there weren't plenty of Atari ST and Amiga owners with hard drives in my area around me, uh, especially when the Amiga 600 and the 1200 came out with their native IDE controller built into it. Um, but I didn't, I didn't see them. I wasn't moving in that circle of friends. So it was only my PC owning friends that had hard disks around me. 
Well, Neil, it looks like people who did own hard drives on their computers back in the early days, uh, the, the contents of those drives have recently become a hot commodity. Thanks to a story from Wired shared with us by subreddit user Remington Noiseless, it appears that vintage electronic finds either on eBay or at thrift stores often come complete with a little time capsule of their previous owners' lives. Of course, in the days before the internet, little thought was given to locking down personal files on computers, and they were often inextricably tied to the machines themselves. As computers were retired and moved to the loft or the basement, their hard drive's content stayed intact. So in the story, you can read this in the show notes uh, from Wired. Uh, the author interviews uh, a guy named John Bumstead, a restorer and reseller of vintage computers who detail the contents of these computers. Uh, he says in addition to personal files such as tax returns, medical documents, and diaries, uh, there are also applications that, you know, just, you know, one-off applications that alter the operating system, obscure homemade utilities, and other interesting ephemera from the past that are not quite so well personal in nature. Uh, the question is, where do you draw the line? Uh, Neil, when you acquire a vintage machine with a hard drive, do you immediately in good conscience wipe it or do you have a poke around first just to see what's on there? Of course I have a poke around first. Um, it's interesting, isn't it? I, I've, if it doesn't exist, someone should have a, a YouTube channel called like, I don't know, the Digital Morgue or something like that where mm -hmm. <laughs> forensically mm -hmm try and piece together someone's lives from the evidence that you can find on a whole old hard disk it's a lot of fun um yes absolutely i, I come across a lot of this on old machines uh, the reason i don't instantly wipe a machine is usually i want to see if it boots if the operating system's still working if all the drivers are on there because it can save me a hell of a lot of time if i can just sure go into device manager and see what drivers i need and all of that stuff um but some examples i can give you uh, there was a macintosh i picked up uh, recently, and that was a real insight into what I describe as a, the love smitten brain of a young lady. Um, <laughs> she, she had a diary on this Mac, um, and it talked over and over about this guy that she liked and the things that he'd said to her. And you know, was it a sign? Wasn't it a sign that that he liked her? It was just quite fascinating to read. Of course, I wouldn't dream of putting anything like that on a video. Um, there were love letters on there, which you'd obviously printed out and sent him. And then, John, it was heartbreaking, absolutely heartbreaking. The, the diary went on to talk about how he'd gone off with one of her friends and, and they'd got in a relationship and she was distraught. Oh, I couldn't put it down. I couldn't stop reading. It was a wild ride. <laughs> Digital Jane Austen. Man. Yeah. So um, <laughs> the question is, of course, what do you do with that? You know, you'd like to hope that that information was duplicated when they migrated to a new computer and they didn't just abandon it. Um, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. If they had the sense to clone it to a new PC, they'd probably have the sense to wipe the old PC if, if they're worried mm -hmm. about that sensitive information. I don't know. Maybe it was, maybe there's no record of that anywhere else at all. And that leads on to the next question, which is, is it worth keeping? Do, right. does, is anyone right. interested in this diary outside of me having a having a little read and then going well that that passed some time that was fun <laughs> um should it be destroyed should we save their dignity from someone who might plaster it all over social media or yeah you know, there might potentially be information in there which would allow you to steal their identity or something you know nefarious like that mm -hmm. uh, so it's hard mm -hmm. to know what to do yeah yeah, but there's there's plenty of examples that I've come across from computers. And even more recently, I, I bought an SD card. Um, it was from a shop called Argos. I bought an SD card to put in my camera and something just didn't feel quite right about the packaging, John. So mm. I thought, okay, let's have a look at this, put it in. There was nothing on the card, but I ran an undelete program on there, found a complete set of a family holidays photos. So that card really? had been used. And does, does Argos deal in secondhand goods? Well, I, apparently I they do that. now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Somebody must have gone on holiday, used the card and said, right, I'll go and get my money back on that. Wow, dodgy. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, John? You must have some good examples. Oh, yeah. I mean, the one of my favorite things about getting an old computer is, you know, because people come to me all the time, as I'm sure they do. They say, I hear you collect old computers. And I say, yes, yes, I do. And I take whatever they give me. And uh, the first thing I do is uh, is turn it on and have a poke around. Uh, I love seeing how people use their computers. You know, a, a lot of times people have really interesting filing systems. <laughs> you know, they'll have different folders for different things. Um, and uh, And I just like seeing what they were using their computers 
computers for. Um, of course, that said, I'm, I'm no criminal, Neil. I would never use what I found for nefarious purposes. And I always uh, wipe the drive after that initial boot, unless it's just a machine, like you said, that has some things that are just impossible to find again. But a lot of times these are old Windows machines and things. And so I do see it as a type of uh, time capsule into the past. And I don't personally have an ethical issue with it. I do think you bring up a good point. You know, a lot of times what we know about the past comes from examples just like you found on that Macintosh, you know, old diaries and letters and things. And in this digital age, we don't often keep those things when they get deleted, they're gone forever. Um, it's not like a letter which you could put in a box and forget about for 100 years. So maybe mm -hmm. there should be some kind of an initiative where when you do find things like that, you can upload it to a repository somewhere, uh, just in case, you know, it might be useful for the future. Yeah. And, and we're talking about finding these things in isolation and reading them in isolation but if you put all of these things together you can form a, a picture of you know a social context of that period of time right. uh, and you can make links between them all so actually it would be a really good idea to store them centrally somewhere and you can use the timestamps from the files and things like that to automate how you could search them and, and the picture you could build up so um yeah you know, we lead then down the road of big data and everything that we can extract from it, which would be really mm -hmm. interesting. Sure. Um, hmm. If only I had the time to set that up. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we've, we've been talking about hard drives here, but it extends way beyond that. You know, floppy disks. I've had loads of fun exploring floppy disks for things like sound samples that people have used to put tunes together on trackers and things like that. So, you know, you've got no idea what's on these things, and it's really good fun to explore them. Well, I'm interested to hear what other twirlers think about this issue, Neil. Uh, listeners, where do you stand? When you get an old computer, do you have a poke around the hard drive or the pile of disks that came with it? Or do you wipe it clean right off the bat? Let us know in the comments. So on now, John, to a system that actually comes up quite a bit, or it has done recently in our conversations, and that is, of course, the good old BBC Micro. And it comes up with good reason, too. It was the 8-bit Micro that won the battle to become the machine of the UK's computer literacy project. It helped to educate the masses over here. It prepared us for the new world of computerized automation so that the profits of the future would be more fairly distributed across the workforce and we'd all be working three-day weeks and the machines would all do the work for us. How's that brave new world going for you, Johnny? Are you popping up to the edge of space in your personal rocket ship this weekend? You know, the whole idea, because everybody's read this a million times, the, the whole <laughs> idea of our capitalistic overlords actually giving workers additional time off instead of just demanding even more productivity due to time-saving technology, that's always struck me as the most unbelievable part of our imagined future. <laughs> There's no way that would ever happen. Um, that said, when I can pop into a flying and or self-driving car that works exactly the way it should and doesn't make an attempt to terminate my life, I will consider myself truly living in the future neil but newsflash we are not there yet not yet we're not yet we're not yet there's signs that we're getting there at least in the mm -hmm. self-driving technology but um not not so much in sharing the wealth but no. uh, <laughs> didn't quite work out that way for the masses but nevertheless the bbc micro was an important machine in the history of microcomputing here in the uk and in our preparedness for computing in our daily lives and i'm bringing up this machine because uh, a milestone is looming on the 1st of December, the BBC Micro hits 40 years since its release. And uh, to celebrate that fact, an event is taking place. I'm just turning around because you might be able to see there's a BBC Micro behind me. And it's mm -hmm. got the classic cub monitor on top of it. And I love those cub monitors. They're great. That is a site that I saw in every single classroom through primary school, middle school. The, the, the Acon Archimedes came in later, but there was always still a BBC Micro hidden away somewhere in the corner. Now, the event that's taking place that's caught my eye to celebrate this is uh, 40 years of the BBC Micro at the National Museum of Computing, which is that one on, I think that's the one at Bletchley Park, famed for its code-breaking efforts. And attending this event, which is the really exciting bit, is Herman Hauser, Sophie Wilson, and Steve Ferber, who are three of the original ACORN team who created the system. So where better place to get insights into the creation of the machine, the story behind it, and, and everything else? This is an event that you can attend in person, but um, also looking at the website, you can buy remote tickets. So I think you'll be able to get to, to, to watch in on a stream, maybe ask some questions that way. So you don't need to feel like you're missing out if you can't make it there. And the topics that they've got listed, I'm sure a lot more will be covered, but from a high level, they're going to be covering 
um, Acorn's management decision to seize the initiative and chase the prestigious BBC computer contract. So um, that, that's something we spoke about last week when we talked about the reimagined ZX Spectrum uh, and if mm-hmm. it might have been a viable alternative to the BBC Micro. Um, That was a really interesting one. Uh, They talk about, or they will talk about, the challenges faced when building a convincing prototype in five days and shipping in less than a year. It it was such a fast turnaround. Um, If you watch the film Micro Men, there's a scene in it where uh, they've got the guy, I think it's the people from the BBC coming to take a look at their prototype. They're coming up the stairs. They're coming (laughs) up the stairs and they snip the wire. I think it might be Herman who snips the wire at the very last minute and and the unit springs into life, which (laughs) Steve Ferber has confirmed. It ain't really how it played out, but it, you know, it wasn't that close, but it was still a monumental effort to get it made in such a short space of time. Uh, It could so easily have seen the contract uh, awarded elsewhere simply because they didn't have a working machine to show, you know, regardless of the what ifs, what if Sinclair could have done this, what if their machine looked like that, it it could have simply come down to Acorn didn't get their prototype working and then everything would have been blown open. Mm-hmm. Um, they're going to talk about the fierce competitive pressures from rivals, including Sir Clive Sinclair, of course, but also um, a discussion about Apple, which we don't think about so much here in the UK, or at least back then the Apple IIs were around, but they certainly weren't as big here. Um, there's a, that famous story about the the punch up at the Baron of Beef pub in Cambridge, where a fight broke out with Sir Clive Sinclair. And I think it was Chris Curry was in that fight. He unfortunately um, isn't attending. Um, and we'll hear some more details, hopefully on the aftermath of that. But more interestingly, um, their thoughts on Apple at the time. Uh, the Beeb, I think, could easily have been considered the UK's Apple II. Do you think that's a fair comparison, John? Yeah, yeah. I think that it's it's a, it's a very interesting thing to talk about because the way that these uh, machines were developed, they both came around in, in very sort of traditional ways in terms of the countries where they came from. You know, the, the BBC, once the prototype was, was, was built, was financed, you know, pretty much by the government to put these things out into, uh, into schools, you know, it was very much a national effort, uh, versus the, you know, uh, the Apple II being an American machine was entirely, you know, market driven, uh, and, uh, you know, with no help from any sort of government entity in terms of funding, but they both ended up in the same place, uh, the Apple II, uh, because of initiatives that, that I, you know, Apple saw in terms of its potential for education, uh, really pushed hard to get those machines in schools. And uh, they, it was definitely, you know, if you were around in the early 80s, you had a better chance to see Apple IIs in schools than almost any other uh, any other computer. And, of course, the other thing they share in common is that the joysticks for both machines are just absolute garbage. Yeah, <laughs> they, they bordered the, on unusable. Really weird kind of floppy analog joysticks. Mm-hmm. They're just a bit yeah, odd. Non-centering right? analog joysticks. Yeah. That's not how you want to play games. Not at all. Not at all. Uh, They'll also talk about uh, the engineering chemistry that saw Team Acorn overcome the technological difficulties uh, in taking on the biggest names out there. And also the road to ARM, the architecture that now dominates the mobile computing many decades later. Of course, um, ARM was developed using the BBC Micro. And um, incidentally, there was uh, an auction for a rare ARM module that slots onto the BBC Micro um, on eBay just last week. So you know what that means, John? Auction watch. <laughs> That's right. That's right. It's auction watch. I hope we got lots of echo on that one, Duncan. That was a, a real effort there from John. Well done. <laughs> Maximum drama. Um, so uh, what we've got here is the ARM evaluation system, which... Um, it was the first, I believe, the very first hardware production or at least commercially available hardware production of an ARM chip. I think it was originally developed and prototyped in software in BBC Basic. Uh, it was mm. written in. Uh, and then it comes out in this cheese wedge case. There were lots of other coprocessors you could get for the BBC that were in this similar case, as well as the teletext add-on and things like that. And uh, this particular auction then for the first ARM chip, um, the evaluation system, has ended on eBay at a whopping £5,655. That's 7633 of your freedom dollars over there, John. Mm. Um, That's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. But given what ARM went on to become, I don't think we can argue that that, that is not a piece of computing history. Um, it really yeah. is. 
you know yeah. it's as big as having the very first intel processor or something like that you know um you can really trace its lineage from then to right here and right now and the impact that it's had so i i don't know who's bought that i, I hope it's a museum or somewhere where everyone will get to enjoy it and see it um but yeah you know uh, five thousand six hundred fifty five pounds that wouldn't be a bad investment i think wouldn't be a bad investment if, if you had the money to when throw you, if you it. look at the price of say apple ones over the past 10 years mm. uh yeah uh, buying and this is part of the reason why i think the hardware market is so hot right now on ebay is everybody there's a certain segment of the population that's looking at this not only as a collector piece or something they can you know do, donate to a museum but they're looking at this as part of their uh you know strategy to cash in in the future so mm. I, I like to think that that doesn't happen in our hobby but uh but i know that it does and uh you know 7600 bucks is is a lot of money but like you said when it comes to something as revolutionary as the beginnings of the arm chip um it's it's probably worth it at the end of the day yeah i think so and uh, just before we we chatted today I, so i haven't had time to confirm this but just on discord somebody mentioned to me that um an apple one came up for auction and has just sold for half a million dollars um, right. I, I've not been to confirm. I don't know if you've seen that story. No, I haven't um, seen that, but that doesn't surprise me at all. But if you look back to, I think it was 2012, there was an Apple one that came up for auction and that went for about 120,000. So, you know, a huge increase in less than a decade. And and I could, I can very realistically see that happening with this arm wedge as well. So right yeah whoever you are well done but let's not go crazy here john we're not talking water graded mario 64 prices I mean, that'd, that'd be crazy that'd be crazy <laughs> that would be crazy this this thing only changed the world of portable computing nothing nothing more than that. <laughs> so um as the milestone approaches uh of the bbc micro's 40th birthday perhaps take some time to reacquaint yourself with the bbc micro try it out for the first time if you haven't tried it see what it was all about check out the event at the national museum of computing uh, all the links will be uh, below the show in, in the show notes uh, and let us know on the subreddit what your BBC micro memories are. Pac-Man, Neil. Pac-Man. Has there ever been a more iconic figure in the world of video games? He's got to be up there, hasn't he? Um, the shape, the sound, the, the, the sound he makes when he's gobbling up those dots, the music. Um, it, it's all burned into pretty much every gamer over a certain age, isn't it? Or even current gamers, you know, there are loads of current gamers who will be very familiar with the game and not just the name. It, it really is it, timeless, isn't it, Pac-Man? It is. It is. I, I really believe that Pac-Man is the first and the last word on video game characters, mascots, whatever. I mean, even people with the most tenuous grasp of video games in their history can recognize that yellow pizza shaped object. Uh, Pac-Man was video gaming's first real mascot. And the fact that you still see the machine or more likely the Miss Pac-Man variety in places where arcade machines have all but died only speak to the staying power of the character in the game. Even, you know, Whenever they uh, have stories about video games and do they cause violence on TV, on the news and things like that, you always have one incredulous reporter that just says, whatever happened to Pac-Man? <laughs> As if, you know, <laughs> video games are still stuck in 1980. Well, Neil, it's with a heavy heart that I report that the creator of the Pac-Man character, Hiroshi Ono, affectionately nicknamed Mr. Dotman, has died at the age of 64 after a long illness. Um, ono joined namco the company responsible for pac-man as well as so many other classic arcade titles way back in 1989 and stayed with the company until 2013 1979 through 2013 quite the tenure in the constantly evolving world of video games and uh, he created not only the artwork for the pac-man arcade cabinet but also pixel art for many of namco's most enduring games uh, most famously the sprites for what some people think of as the quintessential space shooter, uh, Galaga. Uh, in the article linked in the show notes from Video Games Chronicle, you can actually see scans of the graph paper Ono used to design the alien sprites in Galaga, as well as their rotation and animation. I always love seeing these early concepts on analog formats like graph paper before they transition into the digital world. Um, Ono also designed the sprites for Dig Dug and Mappy, and uh, he worked at least in part on pole position and a whole host of other games in the golden age of arcade gaming. Now, Pac-Man, Dig Dug, Mappy, which of those three is your go-to game, Neil? Oh, of those three, um, 
I would probably go with Dig Dug. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily the best of those three, but th that used to always be at the back of an arcade that I went to when I was at college. Despite being pretty ancient by that point, it was super cheap to play compared to all the other arcade games there. So I used to get lots of game time out of it. And it was just a really nice playable game. It, it didn't leave you feeling cheated out of your credit at the end of it when you died, which is key yeah. to a good game, I think. I, I, that's what a way to put it. I, I, I totally agree. <laughs> um, I've always been a big fan of Mappy uh, myself. Uh, you know, since Hiroshi was with Namco all the way until 2013, uh, his talents were obviously put to use beyond pixel art because they were the pixel art market had uh, had, had taken a, a small hit by 2013. Uh, I always have a lot of respect for artists and other creative people who are able to evolve with the technology. Um, I remember interviewing Amiga composer Mike Clark, who was a real wizard with the old tracker technology used in creating music on the Amiga and the ST. And he told me how many of his colleagues dropped out of the scene entirely when trackers went by the wayside. And it was only composers who were able to adapt into different ways of composing that were able to survive. And I, I imagine that it was the same way as pixel art started to be phased out. There were a lot of people who really specialized in that that couldn't keep up. And uh, Hiroshi was. He was able to continue on and be useful to, to Namco, which is really cool. Mm. Yeah, on pixel art, when I speak to Stu Cambridge every now and then of formerly of Sensible Software, um, he's been, he's worked with me in recent years to do pixel art portraits for my books and things like that. Uh, and he's um, he's very happy that people remember him and people love his pixel art, but he's always very keen to say, you know, it's not just pixel art I do. I am an artist that does all of these other things as well and this and that right. and the other. So, you know, it's very important that they extend their skills. When it comes to musicians and trackers that you mentioned there, trackers are a really funny thing, aren't they? Um, even I remember being able to make music with trackers. I just find them mm. really accessible to mess around with and come up with ideas. And um, uh, obviously, if you have uh, musical theory, um, knowledge and talent and a background in music, you're always going to be able to make better music, I think, no matter what package you're using. But Trackers makes it accessible and that, that's really important. And I think there are a lot of modern packages like Fruity Loops and, and Ableton is, is another one that a lot of people talk about that do have that kind of experimental lab style of making music that doesn't you know, give you musical notation and expect you to drag notes around on the screen. So you don't have to know about music theory or transcription to achieve things with it. Um, but artists are artists. Where there's, when there's a will, they'll find a way of being creative. So uh, I'm not surprised that we lost a lot of musicians uh, based on that story that you told us of, of Mike Clark. But um, at the same time, I'm sure a lot, a lot adapted to survive or, or moved sideways into different areas to express their art uh, away from computing. Yeah. yeah. So a melancholy happy trails to Hiroshi Ono, truly one of the giants of gaming history. I know this evening I'm going to be playing a few rounds of Mappy in his honor. Won't you join me? John, it's time for some mini news. I live for mini news. Neil. <laughs> I know you do. I know you do. Uh, well, when we've talked about minis in the past, we've always had to consider that that balance of aesthetics against practicality. Can you actually game on it? Uh, is it more of a decorative ornament that you'd put on your shelf and never actually pick up and use? Do the proportions get all out of shape in order to accommodate normal sized hands as, as you scale down this thing? Um, all of those kinds of things have to be considered. Well, this week, all of that goes out of the window absolutely all of it because this isn't a mini this is a micro john this is a new kickstarter and it's promoting the world's smallest video games console which is the size of your thumb um it's so small that the promotional photo shows a bee sat on it playing it <laughs> and, the, and the bee <laughs> is about the right size to play on this thing that's how small it is it's an insect sized console and it's called thummy shall i sign you up john I want nothing to do with an object named Thumby. <laughs> well, uh, let me tell you, John, uh, uh, a Thumby or a Thummy. Is it Thummy or Thumby? See, I said Thummy and you said Thumby. Yeah, I, I guess I was thinking about it rhymes with Gumby, but you're probably right because you don't pronounce the B in thumb. Yeah. Weird. I don't know. Well, I'll go with Thummy then. So, uh, All right, go the for thummy, it. The Thummy, it will set you back just 14 pounds. So that's good news. You know, this is borderline pocket money prices, at least in the context of retro game collecting. So this thing was a Kickstarter by the American firm Tiny Circuits, 
very apt name indeed. And it basically looks like a Game Boy that's been scaled down to the dimensions of three centimeters by 1.8 centimeters by 0.9 centimeters, <laughs> less than a centimeter in uh, depth, I think that is. And um, well, you'd think it would be utterly unusable at that size. And well, yeah, it does look pretty unusable to me <laughs> at that size, <laughs> it, you know. Um, uh, yeah, it, it is absolutely tiny, uh, but it does have some some key features to it so it does allow you to plug it in via micro usb and, and you can put your own homebrew on there and do a little bit of programming and have some fun so that, that could be fun and if you're laughing at this thing and thinking oh man what a silly thing this is what a stupid thing this is who, who would want this well it does have a special feature it has a keychain now i personally think that that changes everything john um you know i'm not i'm not even joking about this here if you consider this to be a gaming device then you're going to use that that you want to use for hours at a time then of course it's silly you're not going to get that kind of enjoyment out of a device this small but if you consider it to be a 14 pound keychain that you can customize maybe have it trigger some retro sounds or you could have a little attract screen on there for one of your favorite old arcade games to show your friends I don't know. I think I think that's fourteen pounds well spent. I think you can spend that much money on a uh, Mister T keychain that spits out all of his favourite phrases, you know, quite easily. <laughs> so to have something you could plug in and program is kind of fun. Um, yeah, I mean it's funny, isn't it? When, when mini consoles come along, uh, I think we have quite a high bar for what we expect these things to deliver to justify their existence. Um, and, and so they should, uh, when when you consider the price of them and how far cheaper hardware can often recreate the experience i am of course often thinking about raspberry pis and things like that uh, but i think this the, the thummy is something that's not really worried about fo poking fun at itself it's cheap it's cheerful it'll make you smile without making you question your life choices while you stare at an empty wallet so for that reason john <laughs> I am going to, without even consenting with you, without your permission, I'm going to give the Thummy the, the TWIR mini seal of approval, whether you're on board with me or not. <laughs> Have I persuaded you? Have I made a, a valid argument? Neil, I think this is where I draw the line. Oh, no. <laughs> like this, you know, here's the thing about these mini consoles, okay? They've got to do one of two things. They've got to capture the essence of a machine that i have warm fuzzy nostalgia for as a youth they've got to be able to sit on a shelf and look cool um or uh they've got to offer you know some sort of gaming experience plugging into the tv that is uh that gives me a reason to want to go for that over emulation so i give you in this example uh the the nintendo mini consoles which the, you know, regardless of what you think about Nintendo, they really did the front end right in terms of being able to just plug it in, jump into a game, have save states built in. The interface is incredibly easy to use, etc. This thing, it really, it it really is a uh, solution in search of a problem. You know, is is anybody is anybody clamoring for a, a unit this small? Um, and if you are going to make something this small, you know, I would much rather have a $14 keychain that looked like a mini micro arcade cabinet that maybe wasn't even playable at all, but you could switch it on and, and, and you know, have it play cool sounds or stuff. You know, I'm even willing to spend 14 quid on that Mr. T keychain <laughs> pay for this. <laughs> that sounds pretty good to me. I like Mr. T. Oh. So no, Neil, uh, I am not persuaded by this. I think that this is just adding to the, the plastic waste that we already have too much of in this world. I am firmly not on board with this device well I'm, I'm i'm surprised i thought i might have got you on board there john i thought i made a strong case for it but uh, apparently it sounds like a 14 pound pocket fluff collector in your mind um absolutely yeah i i wouldn't mind getting a hold of one i think i could have fun with this um i haven't got the numbers here but i'm pretty sure it, it set out quite a modest kickstarter number that it tried to hit and it smashed uh, over a hundred, hundred and ten thousand pounds on the Kickstarter. So there, there is clearly a demand for this thing. It's laid out on Kickstarter. Right. What it is, what it can do, uh, and people want it. Um, I think that that fourteen pound price point is key to its success. You know, it's almost disposable at that price, but that comes with its own disposable is the apt term. Yes, as you say, yeah, it, 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 we need less of that really in the world, less less disposable plastic. But 
there you go. Um, and another thing, I, I can't confirm if it does this or not, but obviously you can upload your own homebrew onto it to use it. So there's, you know, there's memory on there. So perhaps you could just use it as a memory stick as well, you know, a glorified mm. memory stick. So that could add a little bit more purpose. I, I don't know how much storage is on there. But if you want to find out, the links are in the show note. Um, the, the principal engineer is a chap called Ben Rose. Uh, so you can find out lots more from him and decide if you want to put a thummy on your keychain. Uh, and that's definitely keychain and not blockchain. So that, that's a re- another reason for me to celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> Neil, last week, our community question of the week was, what are your Windows XP memories? We talked about uh, Windows XP turning 20 years old. And we had some uh, we had some responses on our subreddit. Uh, the first one came in from Darkerson, and he said, "I actually still do use Windows XP on a regular basis. Uh, the register at the store I work at uses Windows XP point of sale POS two thousand nine. Just can't kill the beast." So yeah, uh, so I Windows mean, XP you, still alive and kicking. <laughs> well, just in the name itself, Point of Sale 2009. So that was a, a new version that came out, you know, way after. Was it 2001 that it came out? Right. Um, but then, uh, you know, if it's a Point of Sale and the software isn't really designed to ever change, uh, and it's it will either be it would have been kept offline on a Point of Sale, or and it's if it was configured correctly on it on a separate VLAN away from the public internet. Uh, and everything else where it might have been hacked, then, you know, it's like these cash machines that you see running on an old operating system for decades and decades. If it works, it works. So I've got no real argument with that. Yeah. Uh, Reading Glasses Man writes, I preferred Windows 2000, and he specifies not ME. Even now, I think of it as peak Windows, but I kind of got on with XP, even though it looked like it was designed by Fisher Price. For some reason, the snot green theme would find its way onto my desktop from time to time, but there was something I kind of liked about the optimistically bright color schemes with which it came. But for me, Windows XP is all about the sounds from the startup and shutdown to the general in-system notifications. Even now, when I hear them, I can have small fuzzy feelings in my belly. (laughs) <laughs> he says I'm a he says I'm a Linux user now, but I did like Windows XP, even if it did have a healthy disposition similar to that kid in class who had every allergy known to humanity and caught every cold first before spreading it to everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the, the comparison between 2000 and XP, uh, there were changes, but XP was essentially 2000 with you know things bolted on and made to be friendlier for the home. So uh, mm-hmm. I do remember when XP came along. Yeah, I was using 2000 at work. So there was an element of this looks a bit childish when I first installed it. Um, But I soon got used to it. You know, I got rid of the background. We were borderline back then. You've got to remember when XP came out. We were borderline in that period where you would do things like remove the background just to save some memory and and reduce the amount of paging that was happening on your hard drive. So, um, Mm -hmm. you you know, it's easy to forget that, especially when you install XP on a much later machine as many of us do for our emulation systems and things like that. It's um, It's been installed across a very broad range of hardware and on the most part coped with it quite well. Yeah. And finally, Warshi7819 writes, remember upgrading from 98SE, which worked very well, uh, and was hit by driver issues and instability. Not as bad as ME, which I also tried and immediately left behind, but bad enough so that I actually downgraded to 98 SE again. I didn't become a steady XP user until SP2 was released. But after that, I have only good memories of it. Mm -hmm. Neil, did you work with ME a lot? It seems like ME is the most universally loathed Windows uh, platform. I don't remember ever supporting ME in an office environment. It would have been NT4 or, or 3.51 or something like that. Um, but no one in their right mind put ME in an office and, and, and <laughs> put their job on the line supporting that pile of steaming. Yeah, um, I did install Windows 98 SE recently on one of the machines behind me, and I completely forgot that in the install process, there's an option for the shell. And you can actually choose to make it look like Windows 3.11 as an option when you install really? it. Yeah, I, I, huh. I don't ever remember seeing that back in the day, but it was it was there in the install menu. Yeah. Interesting. Well, this week's community question of the week is the Apple II or the BBC Micro? 
which was the better machine? We're throwing oh. down the gauntlet here, Neil. Uh, <laughs> please post your responses in the subreddit, and we'll read the top three most upvoted responses on the air next week. This Week in Retro was presented by Neil from RMC and John Shawler. It was produced by me, Duncan Stiles. The podcast version of the show is available through your favorite podcaster, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And the video version is available on the This Week in Retro YouTube channel. Join our community subreddit at r slash This Week in Retro to suggest and vote on stories we cover on the show. If you watch This Week in Retro on YouTube, please give us a like and subscribe to help us reach new viewers. If you'd like to support the show, please check out the links to our Patreon and Coffee pages in the show notes or in the YouTube description. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week for more up-to-date news for out-of-date tech.